Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Michelle Mather. I'm the founder of the Green Marketing Academy and a fractional CMO for B2C purpose driven brands. I am so excited to be joined by Charlie Martin today. Apologies, we're starting a few minutes late if you are tuning in live, unforeseen traffic circumstances on my end this morning. So it, life happens. But we're glad you're here. And if you're catching the recording, we are excited to connect with you after the fact as well. So I will hand it over to Charlie to just do a brief intro, but he's with the Anti-Greenwash Charter. It's an organization that we have partnered with recently, and I was actually a guest on their podcast. Was that about a month ago? Time is but a blur. <laughs> but I'll uh, hand it over to Charlie and give us just a, a brief intro, and then we'll dive in. Thank you, Michelle. Um, guys, I well, first of all, hello everybody. It's um, it's lovely to uh, connect. Um, I'll try and do as brief for intro as possible. I'm renowned for rambling on, so Michelle, we have to give me one of those. <laughs> um, so, guys, uh, my name is Charlie. Um, as Michelle alluded to, I'm the uh, CEO, and one of the co-founders of the Anti Greenwash Charter. Um, we are were originally developed uh, in the UK, uh, started in the UK back at the beginning of 2022, and essentially we are an entity uh, that is encouraging organisations to, uh, to sign up to a number of standards that we've uh, developed here at the Charter that kind of underpin responsible and ethical marketing practice with a view to mitigating greenwashing and, to be fair, all other forms of misinformation. So that's essentially what we're doing, and the way that we're doing that is, um, is by helping our uh, signatories to verify their marketing practices and campaigns uh, by um, auditing of a third party. Um, and rather excitingly, and I think hopefully, Michelle, I get a chance to plug this, um, the really exciting bit is that we're, we're in the stages at the moment of developing a software solution um, to enable uh, our signatories to proactively uh, verify their campaigns uh, for their use of definition, uh, the substantiation of their claims themselves within their marketing campaigns before published. So that's the really exciting bit that we're Yes, we'll definitely reserve time so you can tell us more about that. And just for the audience, if you're tuning in live, I see some haze in the chat. If you have questions throughout for Charlie, please post them in there and then we'll save a couple minutes at the end for some Q&A if any questions come through live. So I would love if we could start with you telling us a bit more about your why. Why do you do this work and how did you get into it? So Michelle, really good question. Um, and really, I, I tell you what, when you're building something new, I, I think oftentimes you just get so sort of sucked into the, the, the detail of things that actually when somebody poses the question like, why are you doing this? It actually kind of stops you and steps you back and you kind of really think about, okay, well, yeah, what, what is the kind of real driving force behind this? And so thank you for asking the questions that is the first point to make. Um, I think for us, like we've been talking about this, the scrooge of misinformation, the impact that misinformation is having upon like all aspects of our sort of society, if you like, from you know, um, obviously uh, fellow countrymen, uh, you know, coining the phrase fake news, all the way through to implications of greenwashing and the very specific thing that we're looking to address. Um, you know, it, it's a real problem uh, in the kind of the the media age, the modern media digital age that we live in. Um, and I think that is that is our why. Our why is can we find some way of contributing towards improving standards of practice when it comes to you know organisations choosing to, to choosing what they share and what they publish. Um, and that is ultimately the heart of why we're doing what we're doing because I think we're beginning to collectively as a as a kind of a global community, if you like, really see the implications of misinformation um, and getting things wrong. Um, and the impact that that has upon, you know, the speed with which the sustainability agenda is developing. You know, the fact that dissemination of clear and substantiated information is so critical for us all to make informed decisions, both as customers, as, you know, deciding decisions being made about our supply chains and who we're choosing to work with, you know, at different levels, the degree to which we can appreciate and understand the information that's in front of us and, and believe in the information that's being presented to us is absolutely critical. So that is our why. If we can help affect that in a positive way, I think that would be a job well done. Yeah, beautifully said. And I know we chatted about this on the podcast and we can chat about it a little bit now, but there are so many nuances to greenwashing that change year over year. And so one statement or commitment that a company has made 
five years ago may now be coin greenwashing when back then it was not. So, and I like to believe not with every single corporation and business out there, but a lot of greenwashing is done unintentionally. And so how do we educate at the forefront with these businesses and making sure that they are taking action and they're not green hushing, which we can touch on that as well, but making sure that they're going about it in, in the best way, but we will, we will make mistakes. We will put something out there, get backlash for it. We will adapt and we will change. So um, that's part of it too. Oh, I know you touched on this in your intro a bit, but if you could just state what is the mission and more or less the vision of the anti-greenwash charter and the work that you do. Yeah, so so I think definitely our yeah our, our vision essentially um, is all. I think mean, I kind of alluded to it there I think, when talking about I guess our why. Really. Um, you know, the vision that we have is that we can work. We can see a world where there's organisations that that <laughs> and it's been fascinating the work we've done up to this point. Who the, if we can get the majority of organisations, or certainly a lot of organisations, who are starting to adopt a more um, a procedural approach to the way that they uh, communicate and a, and, a, and a governance process in place which ensures that as you've alluded to Michelle that human error that is totally understandable it's just part of the you know the, the human condition etc that we do you know misinterpret things we get things wrong we misunderstand we maybe miss a claim that we've made that we haven't backed up with evidence etc that these things happen what can we do to mitigate that? Well, what we can do is put effective prop uh, governance and procedure in place. And so that really is our vision is that more organizations than not are approaching their communications and their marketing. Um, and in terms of our mission, in terms of how we're, we're, we're going to get there, um, you know, the key to us is, is that we are at this stage, we're early, early at the moment, and we are meeting with organizations that are prepared to stick their heads above the parapet in all honesty and are prepared to say do you know what there isn't a legislative pressure to go beyond what we're you know for example in the europe in europe at the moment we've got the eu, EU directive um, on greenwashing which is certainly scaring a lot of people into you know green hushing really in many ways um but we're what we've got is, is organizations that are saying no we want to we want to get beyond that issue we don't want to just be you know threatened by concerns around you know fines or other regulatory pressures we want to be carrying out best practice and so our mission at the moment is really to connect with as many organizations and, and, and minds really that are prepared to to go beyond that and to do something proactive yeah. i'm i'm thinking is it next week that you're going to calm one that michelle carville is hosting yes okay. i'm very excited to hear what the results of the discussions there i hope to as i shared with you i hope to make it next year but that will be an interesting discussion for everyone involved on yeah i'm very interested to see how the changes in legislation will lead to either just companies being a bit more silent about the actions that they're taking and, and fears of being fined like you said but also maybe it inspires a different way of communicating your sustainability goals as well so yeah I, I michelle i couldn't agree more and i think it's going to be it, for me it's just encouraging that these conversations have been had that people are you know and that's the starting point right? because yeah. the, as long as these events are occurring people are, are beginning to open up the dialogue on, on how do we communicate better Really send my well wishes to the the group next week i certainly <laughs> will i certainly will i'll give you my uh, review post event too yeah, and speaking of um, legislative bodies and organizations, we're going to kind of switch gears and talk about the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Which of the goals, and you can even state the, the numbers if you want to be specific, uh, could you provide a little bit of explanation behind which Sustainable Development Goals that the Anti-Greenwash Charter is aligned with? Yeah, so, so Michelle, really good question. So I would say that obviously in the very nature of the Anti-Greenwash Charter, I mean, Clearly, the environmental uh, the environmental goals was, was clearly what we initially developed everything that we were that we were doing around, um, and therefore, yeah, it was a it was an exclusive focus on the green credentials of companies and organisations that we were kind of looking to substantiate, substantiate and verify. 
in all honesty, because that certainly here in the UK and in Europe, uh, that's the most kind of prevalent, I guess, uh, issue, if you like, when it comes to misinformation um, relating to sustainability. That has begun to change in our end. And I know this is a very easy answer as a sort of way of responding to that particular question, but we really now are starting to view what we're doing as, as being applicable to all of the UN sustainability goals. Um, what, what I alluded to at the beginning, we are beginning to sort of move outside of just focusing on green or environmental credentials and actually looking at all forms of sustainability credential of an organization, whether or not that be finance, culture, social, et cetera, et cetera. Um, with a view that actually what we're, our process and our procedure and our way of working with organizations should help mitigate all forms of misinformation and not just greenwashing. So yeah, originally started in environmental and, and, and obviously the green focus, but um, very much more applicable to, to other areas now as well. Awesome. Yeah, it w very well-rounded response to that. All of them, really, more or oh, less. It, it, sorry, it's probably, I should be uh, far, have a far more nuanced response. But essentially, I mean, that's the question, really, for our signatories, is we said, look, you know, ultimately, we, we, we think it's important that we look at all forms of misinformation. It shouldn't just mm -hmm. be your environmental credentials that are, that are important to be fair and substantiated and backed up by evidence. You know, it could be any claim that you make. Right. Yeah, and speaking of misinformation, I intentionally wore um, my green leaf earrings today because we see this very often in logos or on product packaging that if there's a green leaf on there, it, that could signal greenwashing. Not all the time, but most of the time I found. So, yeah, in, in a celebration of our conversation today. <laughs> so I was actually going to say before that you, if by all accounts, you'd absolutely nailed the, the, the coloring of both <laughs> Your earrings because it's exactly it's the green marketing. Yeah, I, I try, I try. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's sensational. Um, what I would say is that you're absolutely right. Just to pick up on that point about use of imagery and color, that's actually one of the things that when we started our, our, our charter, we, we had an exclusive focus. To be honest, because we weren't informed, well informed enough about looking at greenwashing relating to use of copy and messaging, etc. But we have actually since developed our green claims policy template, which is what we use to help develop green claims policies with our signatories, to include a whole section around use of imagery and colour that looks at exactly that issue um, of how you go about choosing appropriate colours and appropriate images that don't misinform or miseducate a stakeholder of a, some sort of value or benefit that that product, service, or offering otherwise doesn't have. So, you know, you pick up the point brilliantly with your earrings. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> and there's uh, even just more symbols and just mm. ways that uh, greenwashing is making its way into branding even even more, where it's almost indistinguishable of is this company legitimate or is it a form of, of greenwashing? So things to keep an eye on. I would love for you to talk a little bit about what you feel like is the greatest impact that your role has when it comes to encouraging greener marketing practices and feel free to talk a little bit about the platform that you're developing as well in here. Yes, it is. That's a, that's a really good question, Michelle. So um, it's almost like we planned these so that I can do <laughs> so, um, Yeah. Um, no. Uh, so what we realized when we were looking at the sort of the first couple of years of the work we were doing with organizations was that um, and I won't bore you with too many details about how we currently work with them, but essentially there was a lot of retrospective analysis of an organization's uh, practice and procedure working to the way that they market themselves, which was fine, but it was almost, um, you know, after the, the horse had bolted, if you like, to coin that phrase, i.e., you know, we weren't doing something proactive, we were doing something retrospective and, and sort of policing, if you like, of activity. So one of the big bits of feedback that we had from our signatories was, guys, we would love for you to develop something that could help with the kind of proactive development of campaigns that were substantiated and fair, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So we've been working now, um, we've brought on a new business partner. He's, uh, he's a guy based in San Francisco, actually. So that's been quite interesting, dealing with uh, time zones as we can try to orchestrate. He literally gets up and we go, you know, we finish right. off vice versa. But anyway, so he has been building for us, so basically an AI um, powered uh, campaign analysis tool as we refer to it, so CAT. Um, and what that campaign analysis tool does um, is it enables us to analyze 
um, marketing materials on the basis of three key things. The first thing that the tool does is it analyzes um, the, the content for all of the contentious sustainability terms that are included within that content. And it then essentially cross-references your use of those terms with the definitions that you've detailed for those terms in your policy. And what it does, it matches up to see how closely aligned in terms of the context with which you use that term it is to your policy's definition. And as long as you're over a certain threshold, it'll verify. But if not, it will require you to either change your use of that term or to update your policy's definition. The second thing it will do is it will, carry, it will analyze all of the claims that you've made in your marketing content. And again, it will check your policy to make sure that you provide provided verified evidence for that claim in your policy. And if you have, it will verify your use of that, that claim. If not, again, you'll be required to go back and add that evidence to your policy or to remove the claim from your content. And the third thing that the tool does is it'll analyze the overall readability or comprehensibility of the content as a whole. And it will then, if it, if it was below a certain threshold, require you to make amends to the language that you're using in order for it to be clearer and less ambiguous to, to the user. Once those three verification ticks occur, you'll then, as a company, have, an, have access to a type mark that you'll then be able to append to all of your campaign materials, including a QR code, that anyone can click on at certain points, the certified campaign mark, and basically go to a report card where they can educate themselves about the definitions that were used, the claims that were made, and the evidence that was used to back up those claims, and the overall analysis of the readability of the content. And that is essentially the new tool that we're building to help organizations proactively check all of their campaign materials to ensure that everything is fair and substantiated and clear within the content before it's published. And so to answer your question directly, that was a very roundabout way of coming back to you on your particular question. But I think that is the thing that we're developing that we feel is going to have the most impact. And certainly speaking to our signatories, they're really excited to get hold of this because it feels like it's something that will not only improve stakeholder confidence in what they're reading, i.e. I see the certified campaign mark and I can educate myself as to how that campaign has become certified. But almost more crucially, and coming back to your point about green hashing, almost more crucially, the editorial tool is going to build confidence internally within the organization that what they are producing is fair and substantiated and backed up by evidence before it's published. And I think that's the key for what we're, what we're doing. Got it. And I'm just curious, this is not a not on the question list, no, but the, the policy that the tool is cross-referencing in those three steps that it does. Are you, as the anti-greenwash charter in your organization, involved in um, writing that policy in the first place? Or what is the due diligence on that, the, the step preceding the, the three steps that the tool goes through? What's the process look like for the due diligence there? Yeah, so, so, we, so we work with all of our signatories to help co-create their green claims policies. And we have a green claims policy template that, that all of our kind of signatories use. Um, one of the things that we are ironing out at the moment, and I would love to get anyone else that's on the call sort of take on this, um, is that obviously one of the big issues in sustainability is our is the lack of universal definitions for a lot of the terms that we use. So one of the things that we're kind of looking at, all of our system at the moment is being based upon you as an organization detailing your definition for that particular term, and then that being the thing that we analyze. Our big question at the moment is, do we take this as an opportunity for us to help sort of suggest or encourage organizations to adopt universal definitions for particular mm -hmm. terms? Um, I have to admit, that's not something that we've necessarily gone over the line with, with, with a great degree of clarity that's something we're considering. Right, yeah, it's, I mean, it's hard for even states within the U.S. to agree on definitions, more or less the, the rest of the world. Uh, I came across a resource recently, the Climate Dictionary, and they do mm -hmm. as best a job they can as defining universal climate terms. So shout out to them. I think I shared that in our resource roundup to our email list earlier this month. But yes, as you said, uh, that that's great. Uh, I just wanted to, yeah have you talk a little bit about the steps preceding that with the, the policy, but yeah, very important nonetheless. 
Uh, if we have any questions from the audience who's joining live, uh, feel free to post them now, but we will kind of start wrapping things up here. And I would love for you to tell us how our audience can best support you and get connected or stay in touch with the work that you're doing. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So, um, so guys, the, the website is the, uh, is, sorry, not the, it's antigreenwashcharter.com. Um, that's probably the best place to start. We're on Twitter and we're on LinkedIn, so you can find us on there um, as well. Um, the first step in our process is, if any organization is interested in joining the charter, is to actually uh, carry out a marketing practice questionnaire that just kind of introduces us a little bit more to your organization and what you're currently doing in terms of your practices. That then kicks into play our application process, which is where we'll just check your suitability um, to become a charter signatory. So that's the first step, but if you're not quite ready to take that first step, then um, going onto our website and booking a discovery call with myself, uh, more than happy to, to talk through more of the specifics with you. So um, yeah, that, that's the next steps if anybody's interested to find out more. Great, yeah, and we'll, when we post the recording, for those of you who aren't watching live, feel free to chime in with any questions when we uh, post the video and we'll get back to you with uh, with any information that you need. But thank you so much, Charlie, for joining. It was so much fun to be on the Responsible Edge podcast and now doing this today and I look forward to just continuing our, our partnership. And yeah, just uh, love the work that you're doing. Oh, we do have a question that came in if you have the time. Oh, well, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, yes, uh, from Fanny, nice to see you. I've been wondering why are you focusing on greenwashing specifically and not other sustainability initiatives? Sorry, I didn't grab the name of... Ah, uh, Fanny. 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 It, um, it's a really good question. And, and actually, it's something that, that um, we've begun... We, we started in green, green and greenwash, in all honesty, because certainly here in the UK, it's been the sort of, I think, the most prevalent concern around misinformation has been the use of green terms or the... the lack of, of clarity around green credentials. So in all honesty, we, we, we chose it because we knew we were gonna get some initial traction. Um, it's a very contentious term itself here in, in, in the market in the UK. Um, as I sort of mentioned previously, we are now looking at sort of expanding the, the reach of what we're doing to look at all forms of misinformation across the whole sustainability agenda. Um, so it's obviously a, a bigger task and expands the reach of what we're doing. Um, but yeah, that's certainly what we're what we're planning to do moving forward. Yeah, great question. Thank you, Fanny. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and for the audience. Thank you so much for joining us live and for those watching the recording. We hope this has been valuable information for you. If you would like to uh, stay up to date with the other Spotlight series on LinkedIn that we're doing and on YouTube, you can follow our page on LinkedIn at the Green Marketing Academy. And you can also join our email list. I will put that in the comments below once the video is posted. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. And we will see you all again soon. See you next month. Thanks, Michelle.